she was like, um, so why is that? I said she's probably the one that was most like me out of all my kids. She looked like me, acted like me. She was, you know, she was my little buddy. You know, I don't like to say I had favorites, but she was the one that I was probably the closest to at that time. But I had to talk to her out of shame. You know, I just couldn't bring myself to, to face her because the first time I got arrested, I went to prison. But she was six. Now she's sixteen. But anyway, they called me up for mail. I go and get this letter. Come back to my bunk. It's from her, and I'm like, I'm kind of shaking a little bit. I'm apprehensive, excited to read it, but it's still kind of apprehensive, you know. So I open this letter up, fully expecting kind of like a, "Hi, Daddy, I love you. I miss you. Can't wait for you to get home." Completely the opposite. I hate you. You're scum to me. You got arrested on my 16th birthday. You're dead to me. I don't ever want to see you again. Stay out of my life. That crushed me. You know, I was, I mean, you got all the dads in here that have daughters can, can imagine what that felt like. A little bit later, I was at that. There's another, there's another encounter I had with this, this kid that I'd actually met back in county jail. I wanted to go right before I went to prison. He was probably about 18 years old at the time. Kind of loud mouth, but I mean, he's just a kid. He's just, you know, I don't want to say dumb kid, but he just very, he wasn't very, uh, wasn't very sharp. And uh, he was a really big target. I could tell that just by the way he carried himself. He carried himself all wrong. He was getting a, pretty much taken advantage of by the other inmates and, you know, kind of picked on stuff back when he was in county. So I made up my mind, because he was in the bunk right above me, he was double bunked. I made up my mind, I was going to look up at this kid. You know, kind of, you know, came under my wing a little bit. So at the time, I'm almost 40, you know, so I was going to get like, okay, if you, you go to a prison yard, you end up in the same prison yard, you already got to look out for you, but if you're going, you're on your own, and you're, you're going to have to take some precautions because you're going to get used and abused. But we did, we ended up in the same prison yard. But this kid had a problem with listening to anybody. And he liked to gamble you know, with the other inmates. And he'd get debt, make debts that he couldn't pay and buy drugs that he couldn't pay for. And he kept doing this sort of thing. And I kept running kind of running an intervention for him and kind of like getting, bailing him, bailing him out, trying to keep him from getting beat down. And finally, after a while, you know, six months of this, it got, it got tiresome. I said, you know, Kenny, grab it. I said, you got to stand on your own two feet. I can't do this anymore. You know, you're just you know, wearing me out. Wasn't long, coming back from child one morning, and come down the cell run, and they got a gurney out in front of his cell, his body out covered up, and you can see blood seeping through. They came and beat him to death over $13.50. So here I couldn't even look out at this kid, right? I mean, that was a very, that was really that big of a deal. Here my, my grandma had a stroke, my daughter hates me, and kid gets killed. Just one thing after another. I get called to the counselor again. You know, I have a second stroke. This one turned out hard. I call home on Sunday nights. That was my night that I could come back. I call home and my, first, uh, my family call. And I call home and I call my mother. And because my grandma, my mom was caring for my grandmother at the time. And my mom took the phone up to her ear so she could hear me talk. See, she was paralyzed from head to toe. She couldn't move a muscle. All she could do is blink once for yes and twice for no. She would never make a sound. It said until I would call on Sunday nights. Her eyes would open up and she would try so hard to speak to me whenever I had she had the phone with her. All I could hear was this gurgling noise. You know, she couldn't talk. I thought, Grandma, it's okay, it's okay. Just hang in there, I'll be home in a few months. I love you. You know, just hang in there and I know she's just trying to tell me she loves you too. She laid in that state for a year almost, for about, about nine months. Totally paralyzed. Finally they called me up to the office. Again, call them to see it pass. I immediately applied for what they call a bereavement. Out in Arizona, if you are in prison and you have a loved one that you lose, and you have less than a year to go, and you've been on your best behavior, you can apply for a bereavement, you can go to your, your loved one's funeral. I had five months to go. Been on my best behavior, they denied me. Didn't give me a reason why. They said they don't have to. You know, they just denied it. That was the straw that broke the camel's back, and that's what developed. That's what caused my attitude to be what it was whenever I got out of prison that last night. I was so bitter, so angry, so mad. I was mad at the system. I was mad at myself, and most importantly, I was mad at God. I remember I went on the red field 
you know, when it's on the far side of the field, you can possibly go off on the other side of the softball field. Bow my knees, not to praise me, but to curse me. You couldn't let her hang on five more months. After 60 years of servitude, you know, and all she wanted to see me was see me, go. see me one last time before she left this earth, and you couldn't give her that? I'm done with you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. See, I took the same attitude towards him as my daughter did towards me. But you know what, folks, when I did that at that point, my heart turned to stone instantaneously. I mean, I wasn't a good person before, but now I was just, I just feel the evil infiltrate my body. I was so mad and filled, uh, full of hate and anger. And that, that attitude that I had, that bitterness that carried over, folks, if you get, you get bitterness in your heart, if you don't eradicate it, right away it will destroy you. It will destroy you, your relationships, everything, everything you love. It's a cancer. And it does nothing but grow if you don't get it out of there. That's what happened. I got out. You must say, you'd think, the day I get out of prison would be one of my happier days, wouldn't you? Yeah. Out there, they try to get, they bust you in from the desert. Because the prison's actually out in the middle of the desert. So they bust you into the city, they drop you out in the parking lot. And you have to make arrangements to get a ride home from that point, you know, on. And so I had arrangements with my wife to take me up at 6.30 in the morning. They bring me to this parking lot, they drop me off. I'm sitting there, 6.30, 6.45, 7, 7.30. She probably gets about quarter of eight. So instead of that warm embrace and that welcome home kiss that you would expect a you know, married couple to share, you know, after being in the park for so long, I spent an hour and a half just ripping her up one side and down the other. I was horrible to her. And that's the tone for our marriage for the next year. It went from bad to worse. It just kept getting more and more mild. Man, it just, you know, and my wife's not willing to take it. You know, give it to her, she's going to give it back. So it got very, very tense around our home. And very, and very tense. And then everybody got, ladies, gentlemen, <laughs> too. Uh, have you ever watched that TV show Snaps? You want to talk about? <laughs> Women are, yeah, I know. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Snap is a reality TV show. Uh, I have found it's on A&E. It's one of those channels like that. Um, but it's about women that reach the breaking point. You know, a husband, you know, they get to a certain level of just frustration and they kill their husband or their boyfriend, one or the other, whichever, anyway. But Saturdays is my day, wife's day off. And she at least they run marathons. It seems to be where it start, like early in the morning, go until later in the day. And she would watch every single marathon. She started at 10 o'clock in the morning and watched these things at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Every single Saturday. I hate her. I think it's garbage. That's when my dad said, what do you watch this garbage for? She said, because when I decided to kill you, I wouldn't let him go with me. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, you know, you think it was like a joke, but I mean, she was, she said it pretty seriously, you know? So anyway, not long after that, I got, I got kind of ill one day, and Willis kept progressing, and started running this fever. Fever out about 103, and stayed there at park at 103, just stayed there. Now, this went on for days. I went to the doctor. The doctor tried me antibiotics, couldn't get the fever to break. I started losing weight. I got the swell up. Didn't know what was going on. One morning, I'm laying on the sofa. She's getting ready to go to work. I said, All right, I'm sick. I need to go to the hospital. She goes, Well, there's a bus. I'm going to run out here. Go ahead and get out. So you can get on and go. I'm like, Man, that's cold. <laughs> but you know what? I was so sick. I did. I got on that bus and I went to the hospital. And uh, when I got there, they immediately admitted me. Started doing what they call a blanket test. Where they test you for everything under the sun, you know, lupus, leukemia, all, all the bad ones, right? And you know, after all these tests are lying, and pretty soon the doctor comes in and says, Mr. Bryant, is there a possibility that you come in contact with a toxin of some sort? Toxin? Yeah, you have all the earmarks of somebody that's been poisoned. I go, she did it. I can't believe she did it. She actually did it. And they said, that's wow. I didn't say anything to the doctor, but she comes a little bit later once the, you know, uh, she comes in and she's carrying a big belt, you know, from a circle gate or something. What's an old one ahead of her? I said, I don't think I'll pass. Folks <laughs> <laughs> down upstairs. <laughs> you know, it, I wasn't being poisoned, but it wasn't her. Uh, you know, it, was a, it was a medication the doctor prescribed to me. Uh, about six months beforehand, I built up toxicity to it. So she didn't try to kill me, thank God. She, you know, had she tried, she would have succeeded. I guarantee she got watched enough snap. 
we got it down to a science. <laughs> you know one thing that happened during that period of time, folks? Because it was a near death experience for me. The doctor told me, if we don't get this fever to break, I, your organs are going to start shutting down. You can't run 103 fever for 10 days straight and not do some damage. So I, I, I felt my life kind of even starting to leave my body, you know? But during this period of time, my heart softened a little bit towards her. Not towards God or anything else, but towards her, it was soft. One night, what kind of bad that person trying to kill me for that as well. But we began to talk again. And I got out of the hospital, and uh, we, you know, we started having an actual conversation without yelling at each other. She says, Darn, we got to get out of Arizona. You remember what that cop told you the last time you got out? I said, yeah, I remember. There was a cop that, got, uh, that told me last time I got out of prison that he's going to be watching me. He says, I'm going to be watching you. And if you see somebody spill the sidewalk, we're taking you down. If we don't have a case against you, we'll make a case against you. And what they did to me the last time, I had no doubt he was all the truth. So we ought to go ahead and pack up and get out of Arizona. We came back here in 2006, December. You have to remember that one? One of the worst ice storms this place has ever had. Yeah. We moved back right in the middle of that thing, man. It was like, you know, 82 when we left Phoenix. We get here, it's like five. I mean, it was horrible. But you know what? My family uh, prepared a place for us. and welcomed us with open arms and it was amazing it was all this love that I hadn't felt in so long that was here. And my sister is a very she's the one person on the basic planet who can talk me into things that I don't wouldn't do. I mean she's got me wrapped around her little finger always has and she knows it. But she was asking me to go to church with her and I just said nah man I don't want to have nothing to do with it. So they leave me out of that one man. But she's very persistent and you know I can't really tell my sister no too many times. So I proceeded to do the Go to this church and I walk through the door. And it's like walking into a, a warm blanket. It was like just all this love, you know, all this peace. You know what? If you're not familiar with that, and if you haven't been around that for a long time, that can be very overwhelming for people, yeah. especially coming from someone like myself, where I've been out of prison. It's like you, you got your, your bubble, your space, you everybody at arm's length, you don't want to, you don't want to let nobody too close, and all these people are. Coming up on me, wanting to give me hugs and talk to me, and you know, man, there was just too many feels for me. You know what? I'm like, man, back up. <laughs> Couldn't deal with it. And about halfway through that crazy promotion, I tell them all of a sudden I had this water shit coming down my cheeks. I'm like, what is it? I haven't cried since I was a kid. And I got these tears just coming down my cheeks. I'm like, what is going on here? And I knew what was going on because, like I said, I was, all right. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I knew, I mean, I've experienced all this before, but it hadn't been for, you know, years. And so, man, I'm thinking, this is crazy. I mean, why would anyone want to mess with me? You know, it's like, come on. And so, you know, I said, man, it was just too much. So I vowed I wasn't going to go back. But you know what? My wife, uh, my, sorry, my sister is very, very, very persistent. And about three weeks, we went back. But not until I had a little talk with God. Now, I know this is a stupid prayer. And I didn't call it a prayer for the talk. So I'm going to go back to the, 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 the South Park lot and I said, God, I'm going to go in here because I want to make my family happy. Okay. But I need you to leave me alone. All right. we're, not, we're not there, you know, you and I. Just leave me alone. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to do this for my family. That's what I did. I went in and you know what? God didn't, he, he didn't, he didn't pull me, he took my heart. He left me alone. That coldness kind of prevailed. But you know what? I fell in love with this place. The people were so awesome. I mean, the music and the atmosphere and then just the love. And I started making friends, building relationships. See, God's smarter than me. He didn't mess with me directly. What he did is he touched me to his people. God's people. And they're, 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 they're demonstrating the love of Christ and just loving on me and, you know, just you know, encouraging me talking me up instead of talking me down, which I was used to almost my entire life. And man, it's like, oh, you know, and you know what, at, at the time, they needed help with their media department. And with my experience in video productions, you know, they figured it might be a good opportunity to ask me and get me a little more involved. And so they asked me if I'd help out with the media department. I said, sure, I'll help out. From there, and we were doing that for a little bit. And they said, you know what, we really need help with our editing. Would you mind coming in and we can help them edit our publishing program? Sure. He has me the keys of the church. I'm holding his keys and I'm like, holy cow. I went home to my wife and said, they gave me the keys of the church. Because do they know who you are? 
<laughs> I said, no, I don't think so. <clears throat> so, next day I go in. <laughs> next day I go in and uh, sit down with the pastors and I tell my story. They're, they're going to trust me to keep this church all those million dollars of TV equipment and all this other stuff. But they got a lot of what's going on here. So I told them all about my history and my past. And I said, I fully expect them to say, give the keys back. <laughs> but, that was you then. That's not you now. We love you. Welcome aboard. Folks, I can tell you right now, there's nobody ever in my life has ever put faith in me like that, trusted me like that. Blew me away. And that was a God thing. You know what I'm saying? And, that's, and God started showing up like that. And he kept showing up, doing amazing things like that. But a couple months into the, my uh, editing career there, um, I'm there midweek editing one day, and all of a sudden, kind of like you was talking about earlier, Brother Roy, I got this pain in my chest. And I'm by myself in the church. And it starts here, with my shoulder, down my arm, upside down my neck, my face. I'm not a doctor, but I don't think that's any good. You know, so I kind of start to panic a little bit, but I am by myself. So I call my doctor up, tell him what's going on. He says, the other phone right now, call 911, get to the hospital. It's all right. I hang up and say, okay, I'll go to the hospital. I'm not going to call one the hospital one mile away, I'll go to the So I go out and get in the car. By the time I get there, I can't get out of the car. They rush out with the gurney, load me up, get me in there, take me straight into the room, and they're rushing around, <coughs> taking my shirt, stabbing my stomach, all these hypodermic needles, and you know, blood thinners and stuff. And you could have already had a crash cart, starting to grease up the paddles. I'm like, I'm not even out yet, guys. You know, but they're just acting in it like a panic. And so run all these tests, the scopes, and do all, their, all the business they do. And Dr. Cummins says, Mr. Bryant, we've got a blockage. We gotta go in the morning to take care of that. Wow, block is fine this morning. That makes no sense. Well, that's the way these things work sometimes. So, and the next morning I'm laying there in the hospital bed. My wife's there with me. And uh, they put these natural glycerin patches on me, you know, the night before. And they told me that morning, they said, okay, we're gonna take these patches off. You know, we, we have to take them off before we do the procedure. But when we do that, the pain is gonna come back. All right? But before this had all happened, before they came in and took those patches off, uh, there were two gentlemen that showed up. To my room. And these were guys that were from our church, they were on the pastoral team. What they do is they go around to like the hospitals and the nursing homes and things like that and do all the business. And I didn't know them at all then. Now I know them very well. But they come in and talk with me for a bit. They say, can we pray for you? I said, sure. I, pray for me. I didn't see any harm in it. Yeah. <coughs> so they anointed my head with oil, prayed for me. They left. My wife said, oh, that was a nice woman. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Thinking more about it. So when the doctor's going to take those patches off, they're, they're advising me that this pain's going to come back. And I need to be aware of it because I didn't want to be panicking because this pain's coming back. All right, so they take the patches off. Five minutes later, any pain yet? No. Ten minutes, any pain yet? No. Half hour, any pain yet? No. They go in, they take me in, put another scope. Why is it going? Oh, yeah. I didn't get it. I'm thinking, wow, that hopefully you know, really works. <laughs> I was at the doctor giving him the credit. Because he goes, if I would have given him the credit and said that he healed me, that would have meant I had to surrender. And I wasn't ready to surrender yet. A little bit later, I go to a follow up appointment at the cardiologist over in St. Louis. And I'm driving my mom's car, she's with me. And it's Monday, uh, Monday around noon. You know, noon traffic, 270, torrential rainstorm. You can't see past the hood of your car, man. It's just pouring down. People are all driving 70, 75 miles an hour. You know, all three lanes are full. Like, oh man, kind of stressful. But I'm driving. This lady comes up to 367 and she starts a hyperplane. And then she T bones us, and then I'm trying to keep control of the car. She goes into a 360 spin, hits us again, and we hit that center median at 70 miles an hour. Whoa. My mom dislocates the center console with her hips, it's kind of like right over my lap. Cars total all the way around because we got hit twice and hit the beat. So, you know, it's, we can't get out. The doors are all jammed up. Like, what are we going to do? I'm looking in the rearview mirror and I'm seeing these semis coming. The last second is barely pulling over. Cars are barely swerving over the last second. This one. They can't see us. What is it? There's a rainstorm. It's, it's a sheet of rain coming out. I'm thinking, we're going to die. There's no way we're going to get out of this alive. I mean, these cars, there's no way we're not going to get hit again. And when we get hit, we're going to get hit hard. So I think my mom and I, so all, all I can do is crawl out the window. So I crawl out the driver's side window and look for something. Because we couldn't even, we're so panicked, we couldn't even find a flashlight button. So 
I'm looking for anything. I find a, a red umbrella in the back. And I'm standing on the back of this car and getting this red umbrella. I'm waving like this, trying to wave the car's way. Finally, the police show up. They get there, get us off the side of the road. The cops look at the car. He looks at me, he looks at the car, he looks at me. He says, man, you got somebody looking out for you. And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, look at that car. You know, and you don't have a scratch. You know, you guys are, you and your mom, they don't, you don't have a scratch. Look at that car, and you're in the center lane with all this traffic. It's a miracle that you didn't get hit again anyway, but the fact that your car looks like that, and you like the little something you do, you got somebody looking out for you. Because yeah. I'm a good driver. Yeah. I'm a real good driver, right? You know, I, I wasn't about to give him the credit again. I was like, I wasn't going to admit that. I kept trying to, you know, trying to keep God at arm's length the best way I could. We went to church on Saturday nights sometimes. You know, I help out with the service on Sunday mornings and uh, with the media department. But also, Saturday nights is when we went to church once in a while with my daughter. Me and my wife are back row sitters. All right, we like sitting in the back. My daughter, on the other hand, at the time, she's playing on this. She's 13 years old. She likes sitting right up front. She loved that praise and worship man. She wanted to be right up front center. She wanted to just soak it up. All right, we used to like sitting on the back row. Not picking on you guys back there, I promise. But. <laughs> This particular night, my uh, daughter asked me to get my wife to set up with her. I don't know, I ain't gonna do it. No, no, no. That's right. My wife ain't gonna hurt nothing. Well, I'll turn set up with her for one night. It's not gonna hurt anything. <coughs> okay, fine. So we go up. We uh, sit on the front row. About halfway through, prison washer. Here it comes again. Watershed. I told my heart started to thump. Starts tugging. Yeah, spraying into sweat. So I'm like, oh, man, Lord, we talked about it. <laughs> what do you want me for? I'm no good. I'm going to let everybody in here down. I'm going to let you down. What do you want to mess with me for? I'm only here for a moment. I'm going to be probably back in prison someday. I mean, what do you want me for? At that time, there's a lady sitting down, just down away from us a little bit. And she comes up to us, and, you know, an older lady, and I didn't know her too well at that time. I know her very well now. It was my pastor's mother. And she comes down and said, me and my wife. And she put one hand on my wrist like that. She put the other hand on my wife's wrist like that. And she goes, and she says, you know, she says, I don't know this. I don't know why, but God, this tug on my heart. God says, come down. He's got a message for you, and he wants me to pray with you. He wants you to know he's never forsaken you. He's been with you all this time. He loves you, and he has a plan for you. Right here, right now. Can I pray with you? And that was the moment, folks, I dedicated my life to Jesus Christ. Well, that was all yes. in. Been all in ever since. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I'll have to tell you, it was like, okay, <laughs> this is going to be fun to watch. God, what are you going to do with this mess? Because I, I, you know, I, don't, I can't see where it was going to go, you know. But, you know, I, I was obedient. And I decided I was going to do whatever God asked me to do. Started serving in the media department, did that for about seven years. It was like, I thought that was it. I thought that's what I was supposed to do, just serve in the media department. And one year, uh, it was pretty this seven year period, me and my pastor could be really good friends. And one year we'll come back from this conference out in Tulsa. And he's like, man, darn, you need to tell your story. I said, no, I don't. <laughs> I said, that's in Phoenix. You know, leave him alone. I said, why would I want to take a lot of garbage? Out? Nobody knows my story except for you. This is leave it alone. But this one particular time, I come back from this conference, the Lord put on my heart that it's time to do it. So we did. And what we did there, how we did there, because we want to make sure all the services seem the same thing. We recorded it on video. And we played for all three of the services. This is a very large church. And it was a longer version of the clip that you just saw earlier. That video was there. It was actually done in 2015. The actual original original one is a half hour long, which we have that one on the side of it. We cut it down to about 10 minutes for that service. And uh, thought that was going to be it, okay? The only thing was, I was scared to death. I was sitting in my booth and I'm watching this play out on the screens. Well, the entire congregation watching this. And I'm thinking, man, I have really messed up now. These people are going to hate me. I'm going to be a pariah. How am I going to get out of here? You know, these are going to be seat. Imagine this for a second. You, have a, you go to church. And you meet somebody, and you have this friend, and you, you know, you and your wife, you know, go to their house, have dinner, they go to your house and have dinner, and you hang out, and all of a sudden, one day, out of the blue, you're sitting in church, and 
boom, here this comes up on the screen. And, you know, this is your friend, you didn't know any of this stuff. You know, I'm like, man, there's these people around me. They're going to feel the crazy, they're going to be so hurt. <coughs> and so I was scared. I decided what I was going to do. I was stay in that booth until the entire sanctuary came to me. Because, <laughs> you know, there's two way glass, I can see everybody, nobody can see me. So I stayed in this booth, and I'm waiting until the entire sanctuary came out. And then I still opened this pocket board, I step out in the foyer, and there's a lot of people going from that point all the way to the foyer, and all the way to the hallway, all the way to talk to me. And these were all people that were hurting. I mean, hurting bad. I mean, they, they had, we had people that were been in prison and had, had, hadn't come to terms with how to deal with the shame and the guilt. We had uh, parents that had daughters and sons in prison, you know, wives that had husbands in prison. And it was, you know, I had talked to one couple where the husband's getting ready to go to prison. He's already been convicted, but he just hasn't been, you know, been sentenced yet. You know, how are we going to deal with that? Hurting mothers. The thing about it, folks, these hurts were already in our church. They were already there. It wasn't like it just appeared that day. They were already there. But nobody knew about it because people don't talk about it. Those sort of things. Prison not something you talk about. You've been in prison? Yeah, me too. <laughs> prison you know, it's a shameful thing, right? You know, you've been in prison, you don't know, talk about it. Your brother's been in prison, you don't go around talking to your brother's in prison. It's like, what? But what we did is we opened up a dialogue. And we made it okay to talk about it. And then real healing began. Because until you talk about it, Healing cannot be in. It doesn't just have to be a physical prison. It could be a spiritual prison, you know, a, a, a separation. You know, can you be a prison and not be behind four walls? Like I know, when I was out there running, like I was running, I was in a, a more of an intense prison than what I was when I was actually in prison. You know, because you know that is a hard, hard life to live on the run and constantly looking over your shoulder, not knowing if when you go to sleep the cops are going to be over when you wake up. You know, that's prison. You know, I was relieved when I went to prison. I was like, wow, it's over. But also what happened, folks, is it birthed what is called the Green Star Vault. Because there was a real need for this ministry. And we had, you know, uh, I didn't want to do it myself, but my pastor was, you know, he encouraged me to spearhead this thing. And it started out as River Life Prison Ministries. And then what happened is there's a gentleman that came out from Arizona from the Green Center out there, and he's in town. He lives here, and um, or he's from here. He lives there, he's on the board of the restaurant in uh, the uh, Green Center. See if I can get something I'll throw here real quick. Much better. But he's on the board of the restaurant in Phoenix. And so when he's in town, he goes to our church. He comes to the one day he said, I heard you guys are starting a prison ministry. And we're trying, don't have anything to get out. You know, and, and I think it's a, I think we're it's kind of failing. We had zero clients at the time. We didn't have anybody. We, we're talking about this prison ministry, we don't, we're not going anywhere. Which is all, you know, was like we had the plan, but it wasn't working. He said, How about this? How about we send out our team? We train you guys, and you can adopt our four plans if you like. You know, no obligations to us whatsoever. You can take our name, and we'll get you guys going. Now, the Green Center of Phoenix, I don't know how many of you heard of Tommy Barnett. Okay. Right. The one in Phoenix is his son's loot. That's, that's one of the things. Now, Tommy had the one in East LA. Okay. So, we are an offspring of that. So, but that's when they come out and they set us up. And boy, I tell you what, right after that, God blessed us and it just boomed. We had people, uh, you know, we had we got favor with all of our corrections, all of our Criminal justice, and uh, they begin to send their people to us. It is so rewarding. It's an opportunity not only to give back, but to, just to see lives drastically change. There's nothing any more rewarding than when you meet a guy for the first time, the gangbanger, right out of prison, get the tattoos on his eye, put teardrops on his eye. The man's taking lives, and it's hard. He's, he's crass. Doesn't want to hear anything I got to say, but I talk to him anyway. And you know what? He leaves, and it's like almost like anybody else that been in that office would have said, "That was a waste of time." You know what? I didn't feel like it was. And this that was almost three and a half years ago, and I get a letter. Well, actually, my pastor got a letter from the grandmother of this young man. I said, "Thank you. Thank you so much for." Your words are encouraging what you said and what you did for my grandson. 
He was a gangbanger and headed for a certain death in prison. Now he's leading worship in our church here in Kansas. Yes. 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 That is a reward. That is, you know, you can't, you can't put a kind of a price on that. It's just, it's, it makes it all the worse and that sort of thing happens. We had a gentleman, he was one of my very, very, very first clients that I ever had. And uh, actually, he was my first client I ever had. We get him, he had went to prison for a uh, drug induced homicide. That's where he bought drugs, took them, gave them to somebody, and that person died. Okay. He'd been in and out of the system since he was a kid. You know, he's in his early 20s now. He just got done, got doing, doing seven years, and he got sentenced to 14, he didn't have that, so he got out in seven years. And he comes to us, and he's got an eagerness to turn his life around, but didn't know how. He talked with him pretty soon, you know, had the honor to be able to lead him to Christ. And, you know, here he had been consistent his entire adult or juvenile life and his early adult life. Can I tell you today? He is a he volunteers at the Green Center. He just graduated Missouri Baptist with honors and he's gonna be a drug counselor. And he is he just got married, just bought a home. This is three and a half years because of that. Another just a tremendous the only because we just all we do is we just demonstrate the love of Christ. That's all we do. We demonstrate the love of Christ. We do what Christ would do if he was here with these individuals. We fill their basic needs. We make sure that they're taken care of. We make sure that they can, you know, go about their day to day with dignity and be clean and have clothes and food. <coughs> Another gentleman calls me up in this a couple of years. Uh, I believe it was actually I had things are going for about a year. And he was a referral from one of the people in the church. He called me up and said he needed to talk to me. And he just got out of prison. Apparently, at the time, I, I didn't believe because everybody, a lot of people said this. You know, he'd been, he'd been seven years for a uh, crime he didn't commit. And I didn't know, okay, whatever. But I met with him. And sure enough, he did. He just got into six years or something, six or seven, I can't remember which it was, for a crime he did not commit. And then it was verified by the victim. But the time's already done, it's over. He cared for his mother, who had ALS for almost a year at this point. But he was still on parole. Even though he didn't do this crime, he didn't have his name clear correct. So he, he was still on parole. He was still abiding to the, to the state. And his mother began to fail. Or her health just went steadily downhill for over this year's period of time. He was her only source of support and care. You know, He had a cell phone. And he was supposed to have a cell phone. They come in after he'd already been out for almost a year, caring for his mom. She's the only support that he has, and then he arrested him and take him back to prison. He tells me on the phone, he's going to end it all. He's done. He can't do it no more. And he says, yeah, and he told me, he says, uh, you sent him a proxy for my mom, for me, at my mom's funeral when she passes, and she's in the ice cream. I said, Andy, you'll talk to him. He said, he's going to. So I did. I said, I, I will if that happens, I'll probably do it. Sure enough, within months later, she passed away. I stood in for him at her, his mom's funeral. Went to his parole hearing again. He got out. By this time, his mom already passed. And the day after he gets out, his dad dies. This guy is a wreck. Done time, all his time for a crime he didn't commit. Mom dies. Dad dies just a month after that. It was, you know, I kind of know. See, I felt for him as an I didn't know what to say to him. You know, it's just it's so much tragedy in such a short period of time. Well, you know what? I kept talking with him, kept talking with him, kept talking with him. One night, phone rings about 1 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, who in the world is calling at 1 o'clock in the morning? I answered the phone, I said, I don't know. And so I asked the phone, and it was him. He says, I'm ready. Said, when are you ready, man? Because I'm ready to give my life to Christ. I thought you were say, I'm ready to take my life, because I'm ready to give my life to Christ. One o'clock in the morning. Out of the blue. And all I had done up to that point was just tell him about what God has done in my life. And the miracles that he'd done. I didn't preach at him. You know, you don't you don't reach people like that by preaching at them. You don't reach people by love them. And you want you, you know you demonstrate the love of Christ and yes, I mean, you keep doing that, you keep doing that, and it just it takes hold. Folks, 
I can't tell you enough uh, what it means to serve these people. You know, I remember him to Christ, I wouldn't do this for the least of these, you do for me. I had to remember that one time when I was at, I got asked to speak at the Alton Memorial, I'm sorry, not the Alton Mental Health Facility, the Alton Memorial, the Alton State Hospital. I didn't know what I was going to get into. I was like, you know, so, I guess I was a drug, maybe probably got a drug class or something like that, or they wanted me to talk to. I asked them, so what is it I'm supposed to be speaking about, and who am I going to be speaking to? She was looking at about 70 inmates that are criminally insane. And who wants to speak to them? I'll speak to them about what? I didn't know. Like, what do you want me to speak to them about? I had no idea. I'm trying to connect the dots. She goes, they need hope. I said, but well, they even understand. So it's not like they're that kind of criminal. You know, they're, they're criminally insane. They've been found incompetent to the ARB camps. They're not competent to stand trial, or they've been found uh, innocent by reason of insanity. But they're all violent crimes. There's about 70 of them. So I, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll go wherever the guy tells me to go. And I, I go over there, and I remember I walk in, it's like a gymnasium, and they got all these chairs set up, and they start bringing them in in groups. First group comes in, it's okay, totally just like normal. That's like, you know, just any, any group. I'm talking with a few of them, they bring a second group in, they're a little rougher. Third group they bring in, they start bringing people in in straight jackets. And I said, is there a reason we have to have these people say, hey, they're straight jackets, we need to just keep them in the cell, and all they need hope too. You know, we're the people who help them restrain. I said, well, why do you have them in straight jackets? Well, there's one guy over here. He has a thing about, it's, it's an impulse, it's a, you know, he can't help himself. If he walks up to you, he's within reaching distance of you. When you say hello and you introduce yourself to him, he smiled and he'll take his hands and he'll show his thumbs in your eyeballs. And I'm like, well, let's keep the straight jacket on. All right, this one. <laughs> <laughs> then they bring in this one guy, I swear, this guy comes in and it looked, I could have, it looked just like Jim Baker. Not talking about Jim Baker that you see on the PTL clubs, I'm talking about Jim Baker coming out with the handcuffs with the hair all wind blown and stuff like that. It looked just like him. And I had to do a double take, but I knew Jim Baker was much older than that. Man, if Jimmy Swire walks through that door, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I tell you what, folks, that was one of the most rewarding services I'd ever done. These people, I remember, about 17 of them came to Christ that day. It was, a, it, was a, it was a great, wonderful thing. So you never judge an opportunity by a cover that's secure. You know what? Had it not been for God, where would I be? I know if it hadn't been for God's people, I sure wouldn't be here. You all play an important role in somebody's life. A life that you don't even know, you don't even, might not even know the person. Yeah. And if God has done something amazing in your life, and most of you are here because God's done something for you, God's done something in your life, that's why you're here. It's your responsibility as a believer. Tell others about it. Because there's somebody else that's going through the same thing that you have went through. That you, and you can help them. I'd like to challenge you this week. Do something for a total stranger. Something. Just do something for somebody that you don't know. And I guarantee you the rest of your week's going to go much better. You said, what are you talking about? A little thing. You know, uh, me and my wife one time, we, we did this, and it was, it was a, it my pastor suggested it. It was a blast. I mean, we had some great time because they did. It made us feel so awesome. And it uh, has such a lasting effect, we found out later. We would go through McDonald's and we would pay for the person behind us. Imagine that. If you're going to McDonald's and all of a sudden you'd be up there and they say, ah, the bill's right there. You know, it's amazing. Just those little things. God recognizes those. Maybe it's a guy put a little note that Jesus loves you, you know. A little something. Look at that extra tip. Leave that waitress an extra ten dollars. You know, single mom. You know, waitress and table somewhere. You know, I love. You see people. I don't know how many times I've grown up in my the church that I was in. They were very old school. And, you know, maybe all praising there with Jesus and loving God in church, and they leave and they go to the restaurant and you know, and they're, they're, they're crabbing the waitress just because she's a little late or she's running behind and start you know they treat her horribly. You know, but yet you know that's not. That's not what it's about. The church is a lot more than what we do right here in these four walls. Amen. You know, taking it out of here 
and the people that you meet through the week, you know, the everyday people, the least of these. You know, whenever I'm dealing with these individuals from that are, I go to Pierre Marquette and deal with the juveniles there, I go to different prisons and I'm dealing with, I'm dealing with the least of these. I was one of them. And now I am going to them and it's just, I'll tell you what folks, I, if you have an opportunity to ever, ever serve in a ministry like that or even here, it doesn't really, I mean, you can, you can reach out from here and you can touch someone and you can make a difference in someone's life, so for sure. Oh, have, have I started anything with anybody today? Because yeah. I know for a fact that I, that's what I'm on. There is some folks here. You heard them. You got that loved one that you've been praying for and praying for and praying for and you haven't seen any results. You got ready to wash your hands. You can't do it no more. They let you down time and time and time again. I encourage you. Don't give up. They're still breathing there. There's hope. If it wasn't for my grandmother and my mother on their knees praying for me all those years, I wouldn't be here today. I heard stories years later after my grandmother passed out. She had these prayer vigils and her and the, the sisters from the church had come over and had these prayer vigils till 4 30 in the morning praying for my intervention, praying for my restoration. The whole time I was in prison. She didn't live on this earth to see it come to pass when she sees it now. Yes. You know, her prayers were answered. Don't give up, folks. You know, it's, sometimes it seems so dark and so hopeless, but you know, there, there's always there's, there's hope. And uh, just keep them in your prayers, stay strong. Folks, if you want to learn more about myself and about 360 and you know, my life, we're going to be out front here. Uh, we've got the books outside here. The book goes into great detail about my life. I mean, it goes 40 years of just, you know, a whole lot of uh, sin going on there, but then the, the most important part of it is the redemption part. And it's such a great ministry tool, especially around the Easter time, too, because it's a, like almost like a resurrection story. So, anyway, we'll be out there and uh, talking with you all. I'm going to turn it back over to Brother Royce. I thank you so much for your time. And, uh,
And God, yet, when he walked in that building, just reached out to him, reached out to him. And when God seen that wasn't working, he said, huh, okay, what else can I do? Instead of writing him off, God started sending different ones. And sometimes that doesn't work. I've seen people, they're so filled with bitterness and hatred. No matter what God does, they die in their sin because they are blinded by that sin to the point because of their pride, they never get right with God. But it will never be God's fault. Never. God loves you. God's got a plan and a purpose for your life. And until you begin to do that, you will never understand what life's about. But once you find that, that place that God has for you, from that day on, money doesn't mean a thing to you. Hardships and difficulties and poverty and problems and everything won't mean a thing to you. You just go through life with a purpose that's deeper than anything this world could ever give to you. It's the purpose of glorifying Christ and sharing His love with the world that's going to hell. Some will receive it, many won't, but the ones that do, they become a story that lives on and on and on. You've got a story. Next week, next week, we're going to begin a campaign here. I told Dara, I said, God, what you want to share is going to fit in real perfect with where we're going in this Christmas uh, season. As we're moving into Thanksgiving and Christmas, an ideal time to bring people to Jesus Christ. And we're going to give you the tools to begin to let you go and tell your story and touch lives for the glory of God. And wouldn't you love to see this place filled with people that come to know Him, whom to know is life eternal. Amen. I'm telling you, this world is filled with people that are just waiting to be invited to church. They're just waiting to be invited to Jesus Christ. They're just waiting to be given a little bit of hope. So if you're here this morning and you don't know him, you know, I'm not going to embarrass you, but I want you to know you can come to me. You can come to anyone in this church that knows the Lord. They can help you. But if you'd like to talk with me through this or talk with Brother Dar or talk to anyone else that you might be a friend with that is likely to be here today, we would love to introduce you to Jesus if you don't know him. And if you do know him and you're just hesitant, look, he came to church. How long did he come? You went, how many How many years? One year before he really committed his life to the Lord. But he came and they loved him and worked with him. And I'm telling you, sometimes you feel like you've got to be Mr. Perfect. Have your whole act together and everything else. Hey, this place is for imperfect people. Yeah. Hallelujah.
grab a hold of that heart, that person, that individual that might be here that's just battling with doubts and fears and struggling to step out in faith and believe and help them to take that step today and begin to trust in you and Lord that you would lead them step by step into an experience with you would become a story that they can tell to the world and I'll praise you for it. Now Lord as we take up an offering for the dream ministry for the vision that you gave to Dar and Lord the ministry is doing in reaching these prisoners and different ones coming out of, of prison and no hope and no direction and Lord how you're bringing them into the dream center and using them as a channel to give them hope and purpose again in their life. Lord, help us to be a part of that ministry, and I pray you bless the offering as we take it today, and Lord, it may be multiplied over and over and over again to meet the need, Lord, of the hurting, the hopeless, and I will thank you for it, in Jesus' name, amen. The rushes can come, we want to take a love offering for for the dream center and give what you can give. God will bless you for that. How many know you can't out give them? And uh, boy, you never know. You give something and you get to heaven. You know what? You can't out give God. You give to heaven and, uh, and, and it, it's stored up in heaven. He said, don't, don't give your treasures uh, and spend your treasures on things that uh, the moth and the, the rust and the thief can destroy. You give your treasures to the things of God. Lay them up in heaven. One day we're going to reap it. People think we're crazy because we pay our tithes and we give over and abundantly to the things of God. And they look at us like, you are crazy. I'm saying, yeah, I am crazy. Because I believe one day I'm going to reap what I have sown. And if I don't give anything out of heaven, just the joy of seeing a life change. Just the joy of being able to tell a story about somebody that you helped along the way to me has given me my purpose in living. Yeah. I don't know anything that gives me greater joy than looking into the church. And I know some of you, I was the first one to knock on the door. I was the first one to tell you about Jesus and invite you to come to church. And wow, you're here. God's changed your life. Working in somebody's life today. Just this morning. I believe God's going to give us great dividends there. Hope. I live for that. Because I can't give them life. But when I see Jesus give them that life, that change that comes on them. I'm telling you, you can't buy that with all the money in the world. Amen? And sometimes it takes a while. But Brother Boy is pretty stubborn. And I just can't believe that. And believe it. And believe it, and believe it, and love it, and love it, until like Brother Dar said, kid, it's too late, they're, they're gone. But I want to know that I loved them until the end. And that's what Jesus said about his disciples. He loved them to the end. We need to love this world to the end everything that lies within us. Because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And whosoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Lord. Folks, we have a message. Amen? Amen. Let's share it. What has from the car? You and your family can go out there by the table and, and you can get yourself ready. I want you all to see them. Stop and buy a book. We'll give you a free video of the story. Share it with someone else. And uh, don't take it, read it, and then not share it. Give it to someone else and have them read it too. And uh, spend some time talking with them. There's some, those who are singing and worshiping the Lord. If you'd like to come to these altars and pray, the altars are open. Uh, if you want to come and see me, talk to me after church. Love to the Lord, talk to the Tar. You would love that too. And uh, let's just not be in a hurry to leave. Amen. Give someone a hug. Uh, if you want to just tell them how much you love them. And let's just let the Spirit of the Lord have its way this morning. Just going to sing. If you want to come and pray?